morning and uh, great to be here at uh, Entrepreneur Media's uh, Web3 Summit. Uh, so as a, as a topic, we'll quickly discuss about uh, why blockchain is there uh, since last 2009. Uh, keep hearing Bitcoin and the rest of the stories. Uh, I think uh, the main moment of blockchain eventually started 2014-15. We'll talk about how, uh, apart from other sector, how banking uh, is also getting impacted. Rather, at least 60% of the worldwide applications on blockchain are on finance. Not only banking, but insurance and other. Then rest followed by government and then the rest of the world. And I, eventually, the way I always say, like by 2030, we will not talk about blockchain. We will talk about only use cases. The way we don't talk about internet now. We talk about PTMs. We talk about Google Pays. And we say our responsibility altogether as an ecosystem, how do we nurture blockchain as a use cases? Uh, so we'll discuss along with our eminent panel on the banking and finance, how it is uh, impacted. Uh, back in 2017, I started uh, India's first uh, consortium on uh, banking blockchain, bank chain, along with the uh, ECB bank, state bank, ICS and many other bankers, service products like Intel and uh, Microsoft and so on. And eventually we understood that it's not uh, something uh, uh, a group or consortium will help. But we need to have to a right governance to run the blockchain use cases. Where we'll store the data and who will govern that data. When multi-party banks or multi-party ecosystems or multi-party actors are in that use case. So in any uh, uh, blockchain comes and says there are four types of use cases. Typically, one of those use cases is uh, for a country. Uh, the way we see uh, DG Yatra Foundation is on blockchain or uh, DG Locker is a common blockchain. Uh, another use case is around consortium use case, which is typically bank consortium or insurance consortium, where they may say KYC come on on blockchain. Third uh, use case or uh, type of use case is at a bank level or at, or at organization level, we may say that uh, we can have a zero knowledge to organization. Whatever is moving as a data within organization, who are there in the organization as an employee, we need to have a complete clarity that to trusted by this trust layer. And finally, which is very important, that's how the world will come together. It's a cross-border. Cross-border payment, having a unique passport across the world. I think that's what blockchain comes and says, this is what we will do. And a banking per se, in an Indian context, we have seen ICICI Bank working closely with the Emirates for a cross-border payment. Or uh, we have seen Yes Bank has launched one uh, use case back in 18 with uh, Bajaj Electrical for uh, supply chain finance. Uh, IDFC Bank working closely with some startup. Maybe Vishwa will guide how this is happening. Or we have seen large banks like SDFC, Quotas has worked something on a form 26 years along with the income tax departments. So if you say nothing is happening in banking, so we'll prove through this discussion, yes, a lot of things are happening in a banking context and how regulators or banks and various experts and various startup companies are uh, uh, really uh, taking the blockchain as an uh, opportunity to make better banking for us. Uh, so we'll start with the Vipul. Uh, Vipul comes from SDFC Bank. Maybe you can introduce and immediately give back your thoughts. How blockchain will change uh, banking uh, with the uh, uh, or uh, how banking the way we do today is going to be changed with the blockchain technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, Ranjal. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm really excited to be a part of this particular panel because. It gives me an opportunity to really talk about real examples as to you know how interesting blockchain is to banks when it comes to you know collaborating and working together in terms of creating solutions. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be in this segment for about four and a half years now. Uh, work with two large private banks in India, and my job has basically revolved around building collaborations with fintechs and startups. And one of the most exciting areas for me has been blockchain. The reason being very simple, because private banks in India are very conservative in nature. We very closely follow the guidelines that have been set by different government entities and we pride ourselves in terms of being that conservative in nature. Anytime we work with startups of fintechs in India or internationally, what we bring to the table or what our teams bring to the table are insights into how compliances have to be looked at and adhered to and respected You know, when you're building new products and solutions. In that regards, blockchain solves a very critical part of the problem for us. That is identification, reliance on information, and also accessibility to newer ways of differentiating data that was not earlier you know, accessible to the backup. To give you an example, there are multiple applications in the insurance space, 
in the lending space that we've been able to thrive upon, both as a bank and a lot of NBFCs have been able to do that, fintechs have been able to do that, because earlier on we didn't have access to data. Now, uh, today we're talking about getting into the gig economy space. We recently had a conversation with some of the largest travel partners uh, in India, and what we realized was that we want to be able to give out quick cash and quick uh, insurances and loans you know, to people who are, let's say, the drivers and who are driving vehicles, two-wheelers or four-wheelers. And very interestingly, what we realized was that these platforms, like Ola, Uber, Rapido and others, have patent recognition software that's and information that's available to them. So they know exactly where the trip started and where the trip ended. They also are able to identify where the person who's driving that vehicle originates from in the day and, you know, finishes off work in the night. Using databases like that, you know exactly if Let's say the person has migrated from another region in India and is working in Bangalore, which is the predominant area he is living in. So why KYC is done on the permanent addresses, we've been able to do verification on temporary addresses. In making it much more easier to you know, build that trust in the system to give out loans. And there are multiple examples of that. Blockchain inherently is enabling us to have better visibility into the ecosystem with the people that we're working with and also encouraging us to work with multiple areas where we can define new directions for the back and for the user. So it's a very interesting uh, space from that. Yeah, wonderful. And just to support people's remark, and when you sit inside a bank, so I was blessed with that opportunity. I worked with ECB bank sitting in a bank for 10 years. So anything comes to your hand as a mobile banking, internet banking or any service or anything comes to employees hand as a last mile service. Everything is a weighted by process note. And if you look at the process note, which is signed off by compliance officers, CISOs and all the business guys, it has a lot of manual work to do, right? And blockchain comes and says that we can really augment that. So what does it mean that what people said or uh, what regulators keep saying since so many years with a lot of regulations comes in our way. Uh, example like video KYC or example second factor authentication, example to keep uh, uh, tamper proof audit trails or example is like how do I see that integration between fintech and a bank, how it should be future proof, full proof. All of these are the use cases of blockchain. If you sit in a bank, you can come back and say that I can build another 60 plus use cases in a, uh, in a, uh, the better for a better bank. So I think, uh, uh, Vishwanath, based upon your experience, how do you see the traction between bank and uh, uh, fintech companies are on blockchain adoption? Yeah. Absolutely. So I come from the startup world, so where we interact quite a lot with uh, the progressive banks and their innovation strategy for blockchain, right? So one of the major scenarios that is now coming into the fore, definitely one of the most uh, you know, used use cases is the trade finance. So uh, trade finance and supply chain finance. Supply chain finance majorly for domestic invoices where there is a lot of tampering of these invoices and the volume that you actually can imagine from various corporates and their uh, distributor network or from the retailer network is really high. For example, let us actually take as an example like maybe Britannia's invoices. They are small ticket size, there are a lot of them. And you know, we don't know whether they are really putting the right invoices, maybe from the from the retailer's perspective, how Tanya will actually verify, how bank will actually verify, how uh, you know the uh, insurance can actually verify in case if it's uh, credit insurance done. So these are the different areas where uh, the distribution happens. The other use case which we are working on is the international trade where importers, exporters would actually uh, communicate or collaborate over this particular blockchain. We actually do uh, due party diligence, you know, third party uh, due diligence and KYC AML, which would be a record for enabling the limit within the bank. So this is like, uh, you know, translating that again into uh, invoices, trade invoice, uh, whether it's an LC, letter of credit as an instrument or PG as an instrument, or if there's a change in the invoice, nobody in the uh, chain knows. Here, if you actually say the importer, this uh, exporter, the bank, which is the major trust partner, the insurance, the trade insurance, the shipper, shipper insurance, and most importantly, we also have uh, street forwarders of the world. So all these parties have to be on the same page. Usually that used to be happening on uh, paper-based trade, right, where blockchain will be the chief collaborator across these, uh, ensuring the data integrity and data security across uh, the yeah, chain. And, and to my knowledge, the way it works in bank, uh, as a consultant, I, I can see there are there will be a lot of tech companies in the audience also. And you may go to the any bank say, hey, let's set up blockchain. It doesn't happen in the day one, the way it happens for mobile banking or internet banking. 
First of all, awareness, right? Why do I need a blockchain in a banking use case? Second thing is around uh, how it will impact or how it will give numbers, like business, what businesses will bring on. Uh, what are those opportunities? I think it, it takes, it's, it's a different science altogether when you pitch a blockchain to any banker, right? So that's what I always advise, start with a small use case, do the POC pilot, learn from it and then look for some earning use cases. And that's how we have seen how banking, banks are now coming together. We have a bank chain, I give an example, which is a failure. And that's what we learned and we started IBDS, our Indian banking blockchain infrastructure company to bring actual blockchain adoption among all banks. And that is well supported by regulators, we'll talk about. Uh, so Divya, what's your uh, first take on blockchain? Do you really feel that's a really long way to go as far as the banking ecosystem is concerned? You may throw upon some of those use cases. Yeah. Yeah, um, having a work experience in digitization, IT and cyber security, so I have been, during the period of demonetization, I was handling ATMs and chaos of the bank where uh, there was a lot of chaos in the entire country, all of us would remember. So that was a time when people started adopting, uh, you know, debit cards, uh, internet banking and mobile banking because cash was not available so easily. So that was one period. And everyone of us know after COVID pandemic, the situation again changed. Everyone started using and embracing UPI. So even the uh, so-called conservative senior citizens, maybe our parents' generation or even a small vendor, uh, something like everybody started using uh, UPI. I think for blockchain, initially there can be some resistance because there is definitely lack of awareness. There are so many misconceptions and concerns which needs to be uh, addressed. And uh, regulatory wise also, uh, RBI has still not allowed uh, uh, banks to do any dealings with the cryptocurrency and we are not yet supporting. So there should be some kind of clarity from the regulator. And then uh, now CBDC has anyway uh, been launched central bank digital currency and uh, we are also one of the first banks to run the pilot and we are actually using uh, CBDC. So we are uh, literally forcing employees to start using it by you know, doing some transactions and uh, start using so unless uh, you find value in yeah. this uh, i think the customers and the citizens will take some time because there will be initial resistance but definitely once uh, they know the security features of blockchain because a lot of uh, uh, cyber crimes are happening otp frauds sms phishing and uh, you know tele calling you and uh, you know getting your kyc details and just update this thing so all kind of cyber crimes are happening uh, because there is a central point of failure because everything is maintained in a central server and uh, uh, once the hacker gets into access of that particular server, they can manipulate. Recently also one of the bank, the software developers have manipulated the mobile banking app and there is some 820 crores of fraud by the developers of one of the public sector uh, banks. This is the way tampering can happen. Whereas if we know the blockchain technology, it is decentralized and it is tamper proof because whatever is written is immutable. So the hacker should compromise at least 51% of the entire network to do this and it is very very time consuming as compared to the traditional uh, banking so it is more safer so when we uh, create this awareness among citizens and customers uh, i think everyone would love to adopt blockchain technology so i think uh, uh, we spoke about yes fundamentally blockchain is very very important for banks uh, three of us spoke about uh, what are those use cases are doing and you touched upon the security aspects is very very important it, at an organization level the four order of use cases how do you safeguard organization? Like we, we had seen this one and dry kind of a thing, Cosmos Bank and Malware. We have seen that uh, 32 lakh cards compromised uh, uh, in 2018 at Visa cards. All this can be minimal. I am not saying it will be wiped out, but because of a blockchain coming to picture, it gives a challenge for every packet which is coming inside my bag. It gives a challenge that are you authentic source to get into. And even if the signature changes at a data center level, you can immediately highlight that something will change because of some malware coming. So I think that's kind of a use case you pick up and you uh, touch upon very nice use case which is like ATM, debit cards and all, uh, a lot of search has happened during the monetization. And there are good use cases in, uh, 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 it's called as a cash based reconciliation. Typically you get a uh, cash from ATM but you know that's an operational activity to print the cash, move the cash from RBI to the banks, bank to specialized branches to call change branches and from there move that into VAS with the third party partner. And uh, the guy who is actually putting the cash in the ATM, instead of 10 lakh, he will put 
9 lakh 90000 something but in excel he will put yes i have put it and at the end of a financial year it will be thousands of crore amount will go in success account just because of this number small bring blockchain out there so that everybody is on the same chain we can save that much amount of money that's one of the uses now bring your second uh, uh, I, I, I open up which are the specialized use cases. You touched upon CBDC. Vishwa, you may want to talk about which are the specialized use cases of blockchain, right? I keep hearing tokenization. I keep hearing uh, digital currency. You may want to throw some light. Uh, definitely, I think so. These are the next big buzzwords you will see in this industry. So definitely, asset tokenization. So real world asset tokenization is one of the largest area where we actually see greater adoption that's happening. Be it equity, be it bonds, be it uh, you know the ESG loans or ESG green bonds. So everything can be tokenized. So if you actually look at uh, what tokenization does, is to enable the banks to give a fractional ownership uh, to also uh, enable the retail investors to put into low liquidity pools, right? So for example, real estate has been already been disrupted, and quite a number of nations are already adopting this. And banks have been the forefront in leading this innovation of tokenization. And this becomes uh, one of the statements that were done at the that was given by J.P. Morgan is that it's not just uh, an evolution uh, or it's just not a revolution, but it's an evolution. It's a mandatory evolution that the traditional assets which were managed manually has to be tokenized and has to be actually made uh, enabled. And one more aspect of it is there's a lot of cost optimization to this. The cost optimization is the biggest advantage that we actually get. When you actually make uh, any transaction manual, and uh, as well, uh, you know, a lot of uh, you know, parties have to be enabled. Uh, tokenization brings in at least to start with. Uh, you know, one of the banks have achieved almost fifty percent of the cost optimization in enabling this uh, particular transactions. Apart from that, one more bigger trend which we see is the CBDC. Uh, so central bank digital currencies. This is going to be one more bigger innovation and revolution that's going to happen. Uh, already retail is in place. Uh, retail CBDC, we have experimented, we have done the pilots, and I think so. You are in the forefront of the innovations uh, out there in the CBDC space. But uh, wholesale CBDC, also, you know, when you actually look at entire globe, I mean, uh, some of the advanced nations have already done their digital currency strategies and already in place. So these are two major revolutions which I see uh, with the back end of blockchain. I think just to support you, like uh, HSBC, JP Morgan, CT, and uh, uh, DBS, uh, all are already doing a lot of uh, concept pilots on asset tokenization. The way we see uh, banking has moved from branch to mobile internet, and that's why what is baby one of. And we can't survive without that kind of uh, banking. Eventually, next ten years, it's all about tokenization. Everything around you will be tokenized. That's the next level of business model. Sitting here, if you want to really purchase some part of a fraction of a one flat in Dubai, or sitting here, you want to own one painting in a Louvre museum. That is only possible with the right regulation and with the help of a blockchain. Because blockchain bring that trust. The way we will do transactions. And in Indian context, IFSC is creating framework around asset tokenization, and is well supported by banks uh, out together. And CBDC, you spoke, right? People, you want to uh, touch upon. And there are a lot of misconceptions. UBI is already there. I am able to transfer so immediately, fastly. Why do we require CBDC? You may want to touch upon. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, as a banker, I uh, you know it, it becomes very difficult to touch upon newer technologies because, uh, like we said, you know we are very conventional in nature and we have to you know very clearly follow the guidelines that have been put across by you know different government bodies. But I love talking about blockchain, and I love talking about the fact that there's so many applications that are being built on top of it. To the extent that I would say that you know it's also spoiling bankers in a way because our expectations have been you know raised to a level where you know when we look at solutions coming on blockchain and you know when we get solutions the other spaces we are like ah I mean is blockchain better so where does blockchain figure into this because it's a win-win situation for the banks for the users and for the government entities now CBDC is a great example of how you know that can be leveraged and you know while uh, there are a lot of people who will be talking about CBDC I would also want to. Introduce a very quick example where uh, I think a lot of people have not, uh, you know, started realizing that actually what you mentioned in the beginning of the talk was very clear. Today, you know, in the long term, people will not talk about the platform; they'll talk about the applications of the platform. So, in my case, I have realized that even embedded finance solutions are actually being built on blockchain. And the interesting part is 
that we get a you know a, a good sense of security from you know those solutions to be created. Uh, for example, there is a company that we are collaborating with. They help us uh, identify use cases where we can give out loans to Kirana store owners. And again, this is built on blockchain. The wonderful factor is that we are working with companies like Big Basket and Shop Kirana and you know these other integrators of the world and aggregators of the world, and we have been able to give out loans to their partners and their investors using this particular format. And I remember uh, being in the room when this idea was being pitched. And they said, you know, this is how the system is enabled, how it's built on blockchain. I don't think there was anybody in the room that had any questions after that. They were like, great, let's move ahead, let's, you know, see how we can scale it up. Similarly, now coming back to CBDC, it, I think the great part is that the organizations and the ecosystem has moved so fast on that, that it encourages us to experiment on those platforms as well. We are seeing great examples internationally, we are seeing RBI and organizations like RBI Innovation Hub, you know, focusing energies on that talking to fintechs, talking to banks, taking out inputs and creating that right. And in fact, there's a lot of information that is already ready in terms of, uh, you know, step-by-step -step processes on the websites for these organizations that anybody would have access to. But uh, to sum it up, I would say that, you know, because it is such a, you know, great equalizer for everyone, you know, it, it's a wonderful, uh, you know, tech solution to have and to build solutions on. A uh, great example is, like you mentioned, but what I would want people to take away from this session is to also identify what are the other ways that we can build solutions on blockchain, right? How can you leverage the existing systems and build on top of them, right? Look at what would be the next evolutionary part of it. There are a lot of gap areas that still exist and, you know, can also be built upon and, you know, quick action can be taken to build good solutions. Yeah, wonderful. I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, radical use cases for tokenization, CBDC, uh, next level digital identity is going to be on blockchain. The way we have Aadhaar Pay, which is our centralized server or DigiLocker, they are already working on uh, the fourth uh, consent layer. While we have seen paperless payment and data uh, is already being solved with the UPI and uh, uh, Aadhaar and uh, uh, account aggregator. Next, I think consent layer, which is going to come on blockchain, that is why we see a lot of digital public infra companies. DigiLocker, I spoke about, DigiAthra Foundation, ONDC, Protein, all of them are looking at blockchain as a uh, long-term foundational uh, technology. That's what CBDC is going to be prevailed for a long period. Almost 100 plus countries are adopting CBDC. 10 are already live. India is not exception. And India's CBDC will be the uh, point, uh, best, of, best of the best because all the railroads are ready in form of a UPI or uh, in form of a banking ecosystem, good uh, governance guys, RBI, and uh, uh, last but not least, Aadhaar. The way you, you were speaking about security part, which is another radical use case uh, of uh, uh, banks. You want to throw up on how uh, security can be uh, changed or, and uh, whether blockchain is really secure, right? You may want to throw up on that. Security is never 100%, that is for sure. But when I speak about the core triads of security, it is the confidentiality, integrity, and the availability. All three are going to be satisfied by blockchain because. Uh, we are not dealing with the PII, we are dealing with the cryptographic keys and blockchain. So that is in way going to provide us uh, confidentiality because everything is decentralized and immutable and uh, nobody can change alter the data. So that is going to anyway give me integrity. Nobody is going to tamper with uh, my data. Availability for sure because now we all face uh, you know, the failed transactions. Your amount gets debited but it doesn't get credited to your uh, uh, merchant whom you are paying. And after two, three transaction days only, after two, three working days, or within seven working days, it may take uh, different banks and different uh, things. So it will get credited to you. So there is a lot of transaction failures are also happening whenever you want to pay someone. Very urgently, it will never work. So this kind of transaction failures will never happen because it is decentralized and availability is more because it is spread across multiple nodes that way. And just you were speaking about the consent mechanism, we should not forget the DVD Act, which is uh, just now come. So that act gives uh, all citizens the right to, you know, withdraw our consent also. Nowadays, we keep getting so many spam calls because we would have given, whenever a pharmacy also asks, uh, you know, if I purchase so and so medicine, they will ask our entire uh, database, you give us other pan, and we just give it because we are in the urgency to purchase something, even in the malls also, even in the hospitals also. We give out our personal data 
like anything like we don't even care even when we check into hotels wherever it is whoever is asking other you are sending it through whatsapp also pan card also everything you are sending no idea who is tampering all these things and uh, what they are trying to do with your data nobody has having that's a fundamental crux yeah. of the every security or every fraud <laughs> hope yeah so uh, but whereas in blockchain it gives us the right uh, to withdraw our consent also because we are using cryptocurrency keys our personally identifiable information is not uh, directly used it is anonymous and we have the right to withdraw our consent also and when it comes to uh, data minimization or the purpose limitation these two are the clauses in dpd act so if you are purchasing a uh, medicine simple uh, medicine at apollo pharmacy or somewhere why do they really want all your data so they have to collect specific data which is limited to that purpose only if your purpose is to get treated in a clinic or if your purpose is to purchase uh, something from uh, you know a mall so the data purpose limitation should be there you cannot collect unnecessary data and it should not be stored so that is achieved by blockchain and uh, even the consent withdrawal is always available but right now if i want to withdraw consent basically we don't have an idea where all our data is stored so and from where to withdraw how to withdraw suppose if i want to ask uh, some of the bank stop calling me for personal stop calling me for credit cards where do i approach and where do i withdraw that that thing is still complicated but whereas in blockchain that is definitely achievable and it is kind of more secure because hackers also need a lot of time to tamper with the data and if you tamper with one node it is impossible to tamper with all the other nodes so that kind of validation is there so that way it is more secure Yeah, wonderful. I think uh, just to support the web, maybe today we have Aadhaar, which is a centralized database, on, uh, and the way we use happily we share our Aadhaar card or uh, even we share Aadhaar data to the banks. If you close the bank, not still data remains. It's not something like you withdraw the data. And uh, Maru's KYC, which is coming on, is centralized KYC. In the same way, open a bank account, it takes five thousand to ten thousand rupees to open a bank account, and happily you are not happy with that bank, you go to another bank. another thing uh, the pressure is on typically on rbi as a governance body for all banks imagine you have a six bank account it means that you have incurred at least 60000 rupees for one bank uh, for all these six banks and you are banking with at least two banks when you digitalize kyc can be shareable can do the kyc works and that is available to other banks provided and sent as you and the next level of uh, your kyc is a uh, decentralized uh, rather a self sovereign kyc self sovereign entity where you know where all i have given my keys and we can withdraw on the spot from my mobile wallet that's the futuristic way and uh, as a regulator we are working at a regulator rbi we have dlt committee uh, to work closely with the banks which are all use cases we go uh, we spoke about uh, uh, blockchain impact on banks we spoke about uh, use cases how security within a bank every packet which is coming in for level security i think it is a foundation take it will take its own time to really do the Uh, right use cases awareness followed by governance everything is will be taken care while we make you privy to uh, there is no regulation of crypto i am really not required right so there are right use cases there will be always regulation available in that manner government of india and regulators are uh, working in that direction so nevertheless uh, most of the banking will happen over a period of a, a time on a blockchain process while we may say blockchain is so secure directly if you will not configure it well it is insecure one of the insecure because once you write data there and it's available every, everywhere so public private which blockchain you are utilizing which platform you are using how how you are working around that do you have that kind of uh, uh, resources skill available it's a long way to go but the way the pace is there for blockchain adoption is huge compared to internet so thank you so much for all the inputs uh, uh, in interest of time Uh, last two seconds. What is your advice to the audiences so that we are on time? I mean, I, I think so. Uh, this is going to be the frontier, one of the, uh, the uh, secure world, you know, for the data. So, and I also term this something called convergence of technologies. So, as a person rightly pointed out, if you leave open even the blockchain in some of the areas without the proper security protection, and so that's also vulnerable. So what we need to do is, uh, you know, blockchain can be used in multiple use cases that we actually saw, right? One is immutability, and then, then we have distributedness, and we are also looking at the network effect. So there are quite a lot of use cases that could actually. Be so why do we need to tame the dragon, the blockchain? You know, you also need a convergence of technologies. 
when the data records are insecure uh, in, 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 in the part of the blockchain with more security. On top of it, the design, the architectures that have to be built on it is very, very important. The integration is a very important role in block uh, in banking. Why? Because the transaction systems which are seeded for the long years, we cannot just uh, say that we will replace it. One of the people you will ask uh, two seconds, like advice for our. So, so uh, why you know on the podcast picture of blockchain has been discussed? My only one thing is that you know it's a great platform to build on. Consider them like Legos, right? And there's so much that can be done. Please, you know, use your imaginations in terms of what else can be done. I will leave you with a very quick example. Uh, we started working with an organization from Assam. Uh, he was the next banker, came back to Assam and realized that most of the women saved their money in the form of you know, poultry and the silver. Those, those were owned by women in the household. And what he did was he figured out that every time the poultry multiplied, that was like a return on investment that you know, the women folks had. He created a complete system on that on the basis of blockchain. Fantastically well. I'm sure you guys are going to start hearing about yeah, that. So, I, I just wish everyone is aware of what you are doing. Do not download unauthorized applications. Please do download it from App Store or Google Play Store. Yeah, that's yes. totally awesome. Yes. <laughs> so, just be careful whatever UPI you are using on the blockchain technology, CBDC, whatever you want to use. Just be aware of what you are doing and do not pray for it. Malicious actors. Yeah, wonderful. I think we had a good uh, uh, panel. I think the last thought from my end is that uh, see, blockchain is uh, reality, right? Either you witness and be part of somebody else's or be part of uh, the actual change happens. It's a foundation state, and it will change uh, the way we talk, the way we communicate, do transactions, payments, all together. So, thank you very much uh, for, and for bringing this panel discussion in front of you. All.